My first Latino caucus meeting was at NCTE. I don't remember where it was. Somewhere in the Midwest. That's all I really remember. And I'm at this, I'm searching for food because that's what graduate students do at these, at these conferences. I'm searching for food, free food. And I'm in this large hall. And there was kind of, there was a bridge that led to the hall. So I'm in this large hall and Roseanne Gonzalez comes up to me, picks up my, my, uh, my name tag and says, coming with me, we're going to Hispanic caucus. Um, and, and Chris Gutierrez and Roseanne kind of took me to my very first Hispanic caucus meeting. And I think, I think we were it. It was a year later, I think, in San Antonio. Maybe it wasn't even a full year, because NCTE was in November, so it was probably in the spring, that uh, Jaime Mejia showed up, and I don't think there was anybody else. I, 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 the first meeting where Cecilia Rodriguez Milanes showed up was Seattle. There was something that happened there. Amanda Espinosa Aguilar showed up in that one, too. I mean, we had, we had a group, suddenly, for once. Uh, but before that, it was usually just the three of us and at NCTE, Bobby Houchins. I went to my first caucus meeting in, I believe it was 1991 or two. It was the Four Seasons in San Diego. And in a year or two prior to that convention, I had actually been to a black caucus meeting. I was so impressed. They had a, a writer, I don't know if it was June Jordan or something like that, and the, it was a huge ballroom, and I was so excited. I was like, wow, look at all these educators, and they're, they had their own caucus. And then, I don't even know if I happened to look, there was a Hispanic caucus, and I said, oh my god, there's a Hispanic caucus. So by the time I got to San Diego, I, I, I kind of knew there was one, um, but that was a very famous and infamous conference because that was the first conference that we had Scholars for the Dream. And our current co-chair uh, of the Latino Caucus, Rene Moreno, was one of the first recipients of Scholars for the Dream. And um, we were excited to go and see her session. And it was, it was a fiasco, it was crazy. The other panelists on her session we're saying all kinds of racist things about my Latino students are so quiet and my Latino students this and Renee had just given a beautiful impassioned presentation about her experience as a Latina and how you cannot really make any kinds of judgments or assumptions about Latinos because they're all their experiences are different and Renee's mother was in the audience and this woman just comes after her and starts saying, my Latino students are quiet, and my Latino students this. And it was like, were you here? Did you just hear what this woman had to say? And it was so insulting. Renee got up and walked out. And then a bunch of us walked out after her. After we told them a thing or two, we were just, we just left. And I don't know, Victor Villanueva, Jr., who was at that time the chair, of the co-chair of the Latino caucus, was in the session. I don't remember, was he in the session? I'm not sure, we, that came, that was before me. So anyway, we went to the caucus pretty mad. In fact, one, I think it was, maybe it was Sandra Gibbs, who was the liaison to the, to the caucuses, who said, don't get mad, get active, do something. And she sort of directed us to the Latino caucus, or to the Hispanic caucus at that time. And I think right after that, we changed the name from Hispanic to the Latino caucus. So we were, a few of us in there, and we were talking about our experience, and Renee was so upset, and with good cause, good justification for being upset. But Victor also said, this is your organization, you are members, you pay, your voices need to be heard, you need to be involved at all levels, whether it is presenting, or committees, or administration, affiliates, you, it's yours, and claim it. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of felt inspired by that. So I can say that I was mentored through Victor Villanueva, and I be started going regularly to the Latino Caucus meetings of Four Cs, because I was mostly a Four Cs attender, and I have been because I teach college. 
for a while there was a significant difference between NCTE and 4Cs in terms of the Latino caucus. The big difference was that um, the NCTE audience was larger. And it was larger because they made it a point to um, bring in local teachers. So depending on where we were, there we would have a much larger audience. Folks we'd never see again. They'd come in one time, but they'd come in and we'd have all of these local teachers from within NCTE. Whereas 4Cs was college folk. Um, and so for a while, we were alone. I mean, it was Chris and Roseanne and me and uh, Jaime. And um, then later on, maybe Juan Guerra. Um, Ralph Sintron wanted nothing to do with 4Cs. I, had to, I brought him in in the 90s uh, when I was chair. I, I mean, he does such important work. Angel's Town is such a good book. When Ralph came out with that, I mean, how, how, I'm sorry, he had to be a part of our conversation because what he did was he wrote about ethnography as rhetoric. And then his writing itself is, he's an, he's an angel himself, how he writes. The big issue that nobody will want to talk about, but as long as we're doing this, I want to talk about it, was that Charlotte, Charlotte Brooks, um, had made a proposal, this is late 80s, had made a proposal that the people of color from the Latino caucus and the black caucus, and there were no other caucuses before that. Paul Matsuda made his caucus in 99, the beginning of that one, and the American Indians started about that time too. So originally there were two caucuses, well there were three. There was the Progressive Caucus, uh, which was kind of uh, like the lefties, the, the Marxist caucus, the Progressive Caucus, the Latino Caucus, which was Hispanic Caucus at that time, and the Black Caucus. Well, Gwendolyn Charlotte Brooks, rather, um, made a proposal to the NCTE Executive Committee to have members of the Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus go to Urbana to be part of the uh, putting together of the National Conference, the NCTE Annual in November. And so we would go in January and not to censor, but to see what kinds of things were coming up in the proposals so that we could write counter proposals. That was the beginning of Rainbow Strand. Um, Charlotte Brooks made the proposal with that executive committee and the proposal, she made a motion and the motion died for lack of a second. <laughs> so that was cold. That was the beginning of recognizing the degree to which um, all of those smiley faces weren't all that happy. What Charlotte Brooks did, you know, she, this is a black president of NCTE, and even with that, she makes that proposal, it dies. I mean. And you know, parliamentary procedure is such that if there, no one seconds the motion, you can't discuss it. First it has to be seconded, and then it opens for discussion, and then a vote. So they, they just let it die. So she brought it up again with this newer executive committee. That time it went to discussion, and part of the discussion was that they didn't want any watchdogs. Uh, and which wasn't the idea. We weren't there to catch them at anything. We were there to make sure that our ways of seeing things would be represented there, knowing how much of a minority we really were numerically, still are, in that conference. We tried to put together a resource book of Latino writers, including what grade that, and I, I think Bobby actually did put it together. Um, and uh, now that I say that, I don't remember if that was part of Latino Caucus or Racism and Bias, because I was also chair of, of the Committee on Racism and Bias in the Teaching of English. But one or the other, um, a resource book of Latino writers in English and with a synopsis of what the story is about and what grade level it probably appealed to. And it was going to be a loose leaf book, and we started to put that one together. And of course, the other big issue around that time, around 1987 maybe, was the very first English-only law in California. 
California had just got, I think it was Prop 187. Um, and, um, and we had to deal with that one too. Uh, so it was politically very active, both within the organization and nationally. Uh, what we had in the 1990s, I think, uh, was the recognition of the legitimacy of the folks of color. I mean, part of what, and, it, and I mean that because part of what tends to happen, part of what has been aggravating, part of what was so aggravating about Richard Rodriguez was the pobrecito mentality. Um, and for once, we were seen, I think, as not scary, but also not pobrecitos not melancholy, not we got to take care of them, not this notion of developmental. I mean, the developmental, what, what an insult that is. Uh, in the 80s, for instance, when folks talked about orality and literacy, orality meant person of color. Um, so that disappeared. We were seen as, if not equals, I won't go that far, but at least as credible and viable. Um, I, I don't know that that's necessarily disappeared. Now, part of what's happened is that, as I think NCTE are wrong, as 4Cs has started to change or regress or whatever is going on with 4Cs, what has happened is Jack Seltzer, uh, when he was in charge of RSA, reached out to Ralph Sintron. And what I see happening now, and through RSA, and Rene de los Santos has extended in 1999, and I'll finish this sentence in a second. In 1999, this is how I talk. <laughs> in 1999, uh, my, my keynote speech to Four Cs was um, that we need to acknowledge that there is stuff that happens that is rhetoric that is of this hemisphere. Um, and we need to break free and do that, take a look at that. Uh, Susan Romano was probably the first to pick that up. And, and Cristina Ramirez now, um, uh, picking that kind of stuff up. But here's the point I wanted to get at. What Rene de los Santos has done through RSA is acknowledge and unify, organize um, these folks uh, who are doing rhetoric in Latin America, in Brazil, and you know, all over Latin America and South America. Um, and where that is finding a home is not at Four Cs, but at RSA. So it seems to me that what's happening is that while the Latino Caucus is growing in its membership within Four Cs, um, it's doing its homework and its work mainly in RSA. It feels like, and I could be wrong, but nevertheless, it feels like all of the progress that was made in the late 90s has been lost, um, that there's been a phenomenal black backsliding. I haven't heard four seats, I haven't seen a special edition arguing against this anti-immigrant hysteria. Where is it? Where's the stand-up against Arizona? And uh, I mean, you know, it, what's his name? Kent Williamson did a very nice letter about all of that. It was very powerful, very good, but where where is, was the presence of the organization? 